Hello, it's Michael Culling again. Welcome back to our Java Contagion project. Um, as I said, we want to color the graphs differently now. So let's jump straight in and get start coding. This is what we had last time. We had our five graphs on the screen, but they're all black. So if we come back to them, we don't really know anymore which is which. And that is what we want to improve now. I have said last time already what we want to do is color these graphs differently. And we have already a, an array here of the different values that we use for the percentages for each run. We can do something similar with the colors. We just make ourselves uh, another array, um, a constant array again, so it's private static final. Um, and this time we use a color array. So it's an array of objects of type color. Greenfoot has a class called color built in um, and we give it a name, let's say we call it um, colors and then we initialize it in a similar way as before but the constants now are not ints, they are colors. Uh, the color class has some constant values built in so I can say something like color dot and then if you look at the color class in Greenfoot uh, you will see that there are named constants for a number of colors. You can look at the color class here. If you go um, to the Greenfoot main menu, you go to the help uh, menu, there are the, there's the Greenfoot class documentation here. If you look there, you will see the documentation for the color class and you can look them up. But if you know them, we can just type them in. So for example, uh, dark gray is uh, a value that is available. So I make the first graph dark gray then I make the next one color dot, um, let's say I use gray for the next one. So that's a bit lighter gray. Then I use, what shall I make? Um, first of all, let me go back here to the next line. Um, I use, let's say I make the next one blue. Um, then I make the next one, um, what other colors have I got? I have magenta and then I need one more. Let's, what color shall I use for the last one? Let's say I make the last one red. You can pick any colors you like. You can also, by the way, use a constructor here for the color object and say new color and then give an RGB value in if you don't like the constants that are in there. But here I've got five colors available now. So I have an array with five colors and what I want to do now is every time I reset this, I want to set the color. So instead of setting the color here, that's where I set the paint color. The get background dot set color sets the paint color. Let me take that away here and I go to my reset um, method because I want to change the color with every new run now. I need to reset it every time. So I put that in here, but instead of saying black, I say colors and run. So I use the index of my run um, to access my color value um, and that should now um, draw the graph in that color because the drawing is done when we are acting um, so it should use that color. Um, let me try that out. Um, does that compile? Yes it does. So if we do this, the first graph here is now drawn in dark gray. So it looks almost black but not quite. If you look very closely you can see it is not black and now we have to wait until it hits the right edge of the screen and if I did that right then the next graph should be drawn in a lighter gray. Yep, that is fine. Um, but the other th thing I want to improve is I also want to improve the display because I can now um, not see anymore sort of what the previous one were. I want to see all the values as they are being drawn. Here comes the blue graph. I can pause this. So the next improvement I make is I will take the, there's the show text. There is, um, we'll take that away here. Um, I will take the, that is taking the drawing of this text out of the populate method and instead I will put that into the, the reset method. Um, but I, the show text method 
um, is um, shows the text always in this white um, in this white color with a with a sort of border drawn around it. What I want to do instead, so I had this show text. I don't want to do show text. Instead, I want to draw text on the background of the world. So I can say um, get background dot draw if I draw string. If I draw a string on the background image, that will use the color, the paint color of that background. So here I want to, for the string I want to draw, I want to draw this string as before. So I take that and put it here. Um, and I now want to draw this um, at a bit more cleverly because here I draw it at 700 2020 before. Let's say we do the 700 again as the x coordinate, but the y coordinate I want to, to vary so that with every run the next line is drawn below the previous line. So if I start with 20 but then I add on say another um, 25 times the run, so I'm adding on 0 the first time because the run is 0, 0 times 25, then I add on 25, then I add on 50. So I get different y coordinates for every run. So I should now have a different color and a different y coordinate um, so that I can see um, all the strings that I'm drawing. This one I can now delete. Let's see what that looks like. So we, oops, I have an error. Oh, percent isolating, of course. Um, that now has to be this. Yep, now it compiles. Let's see. So we have now written here isolating zero. That is now drawn onto the background of the world in the same color of the graph. So we have this dark gray graph and a matching dark gray writing that shows us that this color is the 0% graph. Now we have a light gray here isolating 25% um, and we get the light gray graph. And remember this is, there is randomness involved. The height of the graph, the shape of the graph will not always be the same, but we see again that 25% doesn't give us a great improvement. Now here in blue we have the next value um, written and we have the next, um, the next graph being drawn. Um, so that looks good. So here I'm getting now my graphs drawn and I'm getting the data painted here on the background of the world um, and that looks nice. There's just one last thing I want to do so I'm almost done. I will get my four graphs here, no sorry five graphs here in five different colors. The thing is that it looks a little bit messy when there are so many people um, that are sort of obscuring here some of the writing. So the last thing I can do is maybe that at the very end when I'm done I remove the people from the world as well because here it will now stop. The people are all there. That is fine. So the one last thing I do is that um, in the populate method I have a line here. That line here that removes all the people from the world so when I'm finished there, before I just before I stop it here, I copy that line in so that I'm removing all the people and then stop. So I think now if I do that, I should get a result. Let me just speed that up a bit so that we don't have to wait that long. I just run this really quickly um, so that we can see the effect. So that's the third graph, fourth graph, and now I slow it down a bit. The last graph being drawn and the people disappear and I can see my data on screen. That's how I wanted it. That's good. With that we are done for today. See you next time. Bye bye. Before we finish for today I should probably say a few words about the model that we have created here with our simulation. Um, our simulation of course is very um, severely simplified. You know there are many um, aspects that we haven't considered um, where the uh, behavior of our people is unrealistic. It is very simplistic. Um, even what we call isolation 
it's not isolation it's not even really social distancing because it only goes one way you know the people um, don't move about but they are not avoiding contact with people running into them so that's one thing we can improve we could improve many things here and we can look at that in the next few episodes but um, it is already um, really fascinating that the graphs are actually quite representative of what it is in real life and the kinds of graphs that more complicated, more sophisticated actual scientific simulation produce that are done by experts. Um, with models you just have to be careful. Um, they all simplify. There's a great quote that says um, all models are wrong but some of them are useful. I really like that quote. It's typically attributed to a stat statistician called George Box. Um, and it's true. Um, they No models are really accurate, but they are accurate enough, uh, or you can make them accurate enough, um, that they are really showing you useful things. So what we can see from our model already is that the more people are socially distancing, the more people are staying at home, the more people are stopping to move around, um, the lower the peak of the maximum infections um, in our contagion scenario is. And of course, in real life, for our for the coronavirus situation that we are currently in, um, it's an incredibly important number is the maximum because our health system can only cope with a certain maximum number of sick people at the same time. And once we go over that number, people die in much greater numbers because they can't be properly looked after in the hospital. So trying to keep the maximum number of people at any one time under the threshold where we can cope with them in our hospitals and in our, in our health system is very important. And we can see that by moving around uh, less, we can keep that number lower. And it actually also shifts the peak um, backwards. So it gives us more time to prepare the hospitals, to prepare medication to prepare the nurses and doctors and so on and by stretching out the curve instead of having it narrow and high to have it wider we stretching out the work over a longer period of time and give our health system a lot greater chance and we give ourselves a greater chance to develop a vaccine and so on um, and you can see from this simple simple um, simulation already that you know it grows exponentially at first but then you have to stick with it and you have to do your social distancing. If you stop it too early, you know, it will just shoot up again. You have to, um, to start it as early as possible and then you have to stick with it until you're over the peak. You can't stop it too early. Um, so it's fascinating that even with these really simplistic simulations, we can already see some real world effects that are actually true. How do we know they're true? Well, with real simulations, typically you don't believe the first model you build um, with simulations that are for other things, not for the coronavirus. Um, we typically test simulations. So if you have a simulation, let's say for traffic simulation or weather forecasting or so, you build your model, you build your simulation, and then you can simulate something that's in the past. You, know, you can simulate last week's weather or um, the traffic simulation of an intersection that you actually have, and you can compare how good it actually corresponds with reality and then you know how good your model is and you can verify your model this way and if you have verified your model and you have confidence that it actually actually accurately predicts um, the behavior of the system then you can use it for forecasting as well and that is in the current coronavirus situation is of course very difficult because we have no past experience so the models that are currently being used are not verified um, they are based on experience that the experts have with past pandemics. And so there is some confidence that we know um, how pandemics work, but we don't know the um, exact parameters for this particular virus. So the models, the modeling at the moment is difficult. Um, there is a large amount of uncertainty in there because we know that the models are good, but we don't know the data that we feed into the models. For example, we don't know exactly the current number of, um, of uh, infections in a population because testing has been so messed up in so many countries that um, the, the failure of the testing actually gives us um, a lack of data to feed into the model. And then of course, if you feed rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So if the data that you initialize your model with isn't good, the result is not very reliable. So there's a lot of guesswork involved at the moment because we don't know the exact number 
of infected people in the population. We also don't know the exact infection rate. We don't know the exact death rate because this virus is new. So there is a lot of guesswork. So at the moment, the modeling that the experts are doing varies quite widely. There's a wide range of possible outcomes because the data we're feeding into the model at the moment is not really accurate. But the more we learn about the actual data, the actual characteristics of this virus, the more precise the models will become uh, or the outputs of the models that the experts will run. Okay, that's enough, enough um, bit of background for you for today. And I'll see you again in the next episode. Bye-bye.